Pies and puddings remind me of my childhood when my mum and dad inspired my love of bacon. Now I want to inspire you to enjoy the best of Britain's comfort food as I celebrate some of my favourite pies and puts. <laughs> Hello and welcome to Pies and Puds. Today is all about my affection for simple, hearty food that's easy to cook but delicious to eat. Sweet or savoury, there'll be something for everyone. Here's what's coming up. I'm on the hunt for something artisan. Uh, hey. Corned beef. Look at that. Which I'll be baking in a short crust pastry to make my hearty corned beef plate pie. Are you always this tidy then? Me? Oh, yeah, all the time, aren't you? <laughs> I make a new discovery that grows in my adopted county of Kent. It's the delicious Cobnut, star of my Cobnut, Pear and Sticky Toffee Tart. Master baker, or should I say Konditermeister, Falco Burkett shows me a German tradition that will never go out of fashion, the apple strudel. Try it. Wow. I'll be returning the compliment by making a classic school dinner dessert. It's a gypsy tart, which I top with fresh strawberries. Give me a fork, I'd like to try it. In a minute. <laughs> then I gather all my guests for a feast. I think we better tuck in. I've been cooking with corned beef for as long as I can remember. It's one of those dependable ingredients that feels like it'll never change. But what does the great British public think about corned beef? I took to the streets to find out. Yorkshire, considered the home of great British grub and an ideal spot for a taste test. Corned beef has a very special place in the heart of Britain's. But most of the time, it's stuck at the back of the cupboard, out of date, and used in case of emergencies only. It's a cheap and cheerful product, and most people do actually question the meat inside it. But I'm not serving corned beef straight from the tin. I'm going to knock up an old favourite of mine, corned beef hash. It's a simple mix of corned beef, potatoes, onions and carrots, cooked in vegetable oil with a dash of Worcester sauce for extra flavour. Brings back memories, doesn't it? You had the tin of corned beef, you were posh. <laughs> in the forces, we used to have little tins of corned beef, half the size of that. Throw an egg on the top, cooks, lovely. And that was one of the best meals we ever had. <laughs> Is that all right? It was very good. What do you think of it? <laughs> you like it? It's the same Yorkshire treat, good. Corned beef might be a blast from the past, but it's still got its fans here in Yorkshire. I know there's great corned beef out there, which the quality of the meat is, is almost fillet steak-like and cooked properly. I think it'd be great to bring something back that's a very British dish. My quest for a freshly made corned beef takes me to a farm butcher who, so the locals tell me, sells it. Welcome to Town Inn Farm Shop. Now, you're a fifth-generation butcher. That's it, yeah. I'm here to actually check out corned beef. OK. Now, show me a corned beef. <laughs> we've not got any here, but we've got some beef, uh, and we can obviously corn it and turn it into a cured beef, into a corned beef. Why haven't you got corned beef here now? We don't make it all of the time, but we do make it from time to time. I might not be getting a taste, but to actually see a fresh batch being made is an even better result. This is the brisket, so we're going to use that one. And can I ask you a stupid question? You know, I'm talking to a butcher here, a fifth-generation butcher who's made corned beef before. What is corned beef? First of all, let's talk about the corned, then. There's no corn in it. The corned is to do with salt, so it's a salted beef. Or, in this case, it's actually going to be a wet cure, so it's going to be a brined beef. OK. And the corns, corns of salt. So, pinny on, and if you can get me some Mallandale spring water... Chris still makes his corned beef with a traditional preservative, a mix of water, saltpetre and local beer. Do you want all this in there? Just half a bottle in half here. Bottle. Yeah. It's very good. Salt, pickle and spices go in. We don't need masses of this added flavour. Right. Let's give it a bit of a quick stir. Chris uses brisket, which makes his corned beef top quality. So just get rid of that string. So that literally now goes into our cure. Historically, corned beef was made of cheaper cuts as a long-life transportable meat. 
It was served on board Navy shipping as far back as the 18th century. This was purely used to preserve the meat so they can have it halfway through the journey. Yeah, I mean, going back to curing in barrels, it would be used on uh, sailing ships in the Navy. Uh, then through to more modern day armies, uh, they would actually have bully beef. They'd have tinned rations. The beef is left to cure in a fridge for a minimum of seven days. This one's already had a week in the brine. There we go. There's a visual difference in the colour, actually, isn't there? Yeah, I think that'll, uh, that'll be good. OK, fantastic. So, really, I'm, all I'm going to do here is cut it into smaller pieces just so it fits in the mincer. So that's the secret to making corned beef. The meat is preserved, spiced, minced, and then cooked in a press. We've got a selection of different old presses, quite a few family heirlooms. So you're literally just popping that in, pressing it into the corners. OK, that's it. And that literally is it. Is that it? It's pressed, yeah. It's now going to go into the oven for three hours. I can't wait to try it. But thanks for everything today, Chris, and I can't wait. But I'll see you in a couple of days. OK. Thanks, please. Thanks. Having seen the process of making a proper corned beef, fresh stuff with great meat, I'm just infuriated. I've got to wait two more days to try it. But there's worse places to come back to. I didn't really know. Yeah, good, good, good. So you come back to try it then? Well, yeah, where is it? It's in the fridge. I don't get it. You, don't, you haven't seen it yet, have well, you? Well, no, you I have, definitely haven't seen it. I haven't touched it. Okay, all it's right. It's just cooked Crack and chilled. Off. This better be good. I've been away for two days, just come back to make sure that the corned beef's good. It's been in the oven for three hours. It's been cooling now for over a day. I'm sure it will be. When we saw it made, it was a great cut of meat. But the only thing I've got to go against is the tin stuff. So it would be fascinating to see my first artisan corned beef. Here we go. Hi, buddy. Same press, chilled, cooked. It is, yeah. Oh, it is cold, yeah. Moment of truth, really. Let's get yes. in there. It's going to be worth it, Chris. Well, hopefully, hopefully. No pressure. Just press these down gently on those springs. Oh, there we go. Looks very similar to it. Not quite as pink, is it? No. It's got the same consistency. It smells more aromatic than the, the tin stuff. Pickling spice. OK, mate, the proof of the pudding. It's past the first test. It's stuck in the tin. That's actually clear of the sides now. Oh, oh, oh. Hey, hey. Look at that. Actually, it looks a bit like corned beef, if I'm honest. It's, it's got a slightly different hue to it, doesn't it? It looks more like a pate. But Chris doesn't look very happy with it. It's not as pink. I would have hoped it, for it to be pinker, maybe a bit longer curing, I think, would be the secret. Absolutely. Also, maybe longer chilled. Yeah, it could be. There's not much fat in there. If you remember the, the meat, the brisket that we used, it was very, very lean. Mm. Nearly too lean. I can't resist. I'm going to have to try some I'm gonna, Yeah, I'm going to have to, <laughs> yeah. Go on. Chris's corned beef usually has more of a glaze and is brighter in colour biggest issue is it needs that gel, doesn't it? It yep. needs that marrow in it. I'd be tempted to actually add gelatin leaves to that. Normally, when we make bigger batches, it, that's exactly what we do. i tell you what, would you come down to my kitchen and bring another one with you that you are 150% happy with? I'd love to do that, yeah, that would be great. Chris, our corned beef producer, has joined me in the kitchen. Welcome, Chris. Hiya. So you brought another corned beef with you. We did have a slight problem with the one up in Yorkshire, because we never left it long enough, did we? That's right. Now, we brushed the last one, so this has had all the time it needs, and hopefully it's cured perfectly. How long did you leave it for, then? Eight days. OK, can we open it up so we can have a quick look? We can try, can't we? Try. So, we can get this out, mate. Yeah, yeah. Get in here. There we go. Yay. Look at that. Look at that. That's all right, though. Hey? That looks like corned beef. It does. You've got a nice shine on there as well. Let me just see what it looks like inside. I'll cut this piece off here. Now, that actually looks like corned beef. It does. Mm. 
That's better, Chris. <laughs> That's more like it. Good. Try it. It's got a great texture to it. It's mm. more, there's more to it. It doesn't break down like a normal corned beef. No. It feels like you're eating a good quality bit of meat, actually. Yeah, well, you are. Now, I'm going to make a corned beef pie. Corned beef I'm pie? I'm going to put it in a plate pie, so I'm going to go back to traditional. Mm -hmm. okay. All right? Brilliant. Yeah. This is a corned beef plate pie bursting with flavour and meaty goodness. Now, all I'm going to do is make a very basic pie. So I'm using celery, I'm using carrots, I'm using it's parsley, I'm using potato, a little bit of sauce and corned beef. Over here, I've got a pan that's heating up nicely. A little bit of oil in there. And I'm going to chop up my celery. Is this the sort of food you go for, Chris? Yeah, very much. Casserole, pies, that kind of stuff, traditional. Especially up in Yorkshire. Up in Yorkshire. Up in yeah. Yorkshire. Absolutely. So the main difference, really, as far as you're concerned, between the shop-bought stuff, you know, the stuff you, you normally get in tins and yours. Well, for a start, it's what goes in, or what doesn't go in is probably more important. And none of the cheap cuts or the, the bits, not even any cut-offs or anything. It was literally just brisket. So it comes down to the quality, is what goes in. The quality of the ingredients going in, then you know exactly what's going to come out. What other food products would you say is better sort of prepared artisanally rather than the mass-produced stuff? Things like luncheon tongue, pickled tongue. I love um, tongue. You don't see that nowadays, do you? You don't, no. You know what? The last time I tried tongue was at my nan's house. And actually, my nan was the only one I knew that actually ate the stuff. And she got me into it. I mean, I must have been nine, ten. To the carrot, celery and onion, add potato, beef stock and Worcester sauce. Then I add the star of this recipe, Chris's corned beef. You want some big chunky pieces of this, as you would do if you were doing a hash. Get your meat, chuck that in there as well. And this is going to be your base filling for this pie. So you need to cook this out for at least five, five minutes for the potatoes, if they're small enough. Add your corned beef, and basically you're just going to brown that slightly, literally just for a couple of minutes. It'll begin to break down. Then this whole thing needs to be chilled in a fridge because obviously you can't build your pie until your filling is cold, because otherwise you can have serious issues. So let me just clean this down. Are you always this tidy, then? Me? Oh, yeah, all the time, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> now, what I'm going to do is a plated corned beef pie. The case is a simple, short crust pastry. Over here, I have my enamel plate. So I'm just going to put a layer underneath before I put the filling on. Roll out the pastry to the size of the plate. Take your pastry right to the edge and roll it out. Push it all down so it gets deep down, because you've got to put some filling in there as well. And then you need to get the filling from the fridge, which has chilled. Then add some freshly chopped parsley, mix and pour into the pastry. And ram it all in there as much as you can. I want it to be a bulbous pie. Still a few chunks of corned beef there, but it does tend to break down, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. No, I'm happy with that. Now, I've got to make a lid, which you manipulate the dough again, smooth it off. And you don't trim that bit off, then? I'd have trimmed that off already. You I'm don't. Going to? No, but with the lid, I mean, you're going to... I'm going to put the lid on and trim it off. Do you want to do it, Chris? No, no, no. Are you sure, mate? I'm positive. <laughs> Once the lid's on, it's trimmed and ready for the finishing touch. Now, obviously, crimping. You can do anything you want with crimping. I tend to use the good old favourite. You can make them quite small. By pinching your fingers together, it makes it more detailed around the outside. And you literally just go around, crimping, pushing the bottom and the top together so it looks like that. Now, a little cross on the top. One, two. We used to call that letting the devil out. Glaze with a beaten egg to finish. And there you have it, a beautiful corned beef plate pie. Now, that's going to go in the oven for 20 to 25 minutes at 200 degrees C, and it'll be beautiful golden brown and filled with that gorgeous artisanal corned beef. My corned beef plate pie is perfect for the whole family. The kids will love it. Chris, you're going to have to wait a little bit longer to try this baby, as I had to wait for a decent corned beef. Yeah, I look forward to it. 
still to come. Konditermeister Falco Birkett joins me to make a German classic, delicious apple strudel. Do you know what? One of the things I love is watching other masters wear. I think it's great. And I'll be baking for him with my take on the British classic, gypsy tart with strawberries. You get your whizzer. Complicated word, that whizzer. <laughs> and I take inspiration from the Garden of England for my Kentish cobnut pear and sticky toffee tart. You're going to play mum for me. Where is it? I won't lick it. How about that? The ultimate accolade for a baker in Germany is to become a Konditermeister, which means master pastry chef. If you think winning the Bake Off is tough, you ain't seen nothing. It takes years of arduous training, and my next guest is a master pastry chef of some distinction. Falco, welcome to my kitchen. Thank you for the invitation. So to become a Konditermeister, what, you have to do one of those and you win, that's it. It's unfortunately not that easy. It doesn't look very difficult to do that particular cake, but there are other tasks you have to master, like, for example, the Baumkuchen, which is very, very difficult on the bake site. You've never seen anything like that in my life. It looks incredible. What, what is that? It's basically our sign of our guild, our trade. OK. I mean, it looks like a load of donuts on top of each other. <laughs> <laughs> Falco has brought with him a very special cake, which I've never tasted before. It's called a Baumkuchen, or tree cake. Falco can only make it on a special machine, which looks like a kebab spit laid on its side. Cake batter is poured onto the rotating spit until, slowly, the layers build up and are shaped into ridges. The mixture browns all the way through the cake, giving it rings like a tree. Then, it's covered in icing, and once it's set, it's ready to serve. Can I take a slice? I tell you what, let's get a knife and yeah. we'll cut it and then you let me know how is the donuts taste. Is that the best knife to use? Right, we take this off. Yeah. So the, it's just the dough, is it? It's just the dough that, that yeah. forces that, that makes that shape. And what's the icing? Is that water icing? It's a fondant. Oh, OK. So if you want to just... Wow, looks incredible. I'll just put that there and looks I... Looks crazy. Try it. Spicy. It has to be. Wow. That tastes incredible. It's very complex on the tongue. It melts. That is exactly the art of baking this cake. And so this is, this is part of the test, is it? Yes, this is one third of the master's exam. If you mess this one up, you can apply next year for a new course. Really? Yes, it's you that will hard. fail. You will fail. <laughs> now, what dish are you going to show us today? Right, today we make another classic. Yep. which is often tried to be reproduced, but never succeeded, apple strudel. People thought of something rolled in puff pastry. Yeah. But because it was copied, like the Black Forest Gato, wrongly, mm. people have, 20, 30 years later, still the wrong impression of how it's supposed to be, yeah. but it's wrong. And this is why I brought it, to show you how okay. it's done properly. Well, I'm happy for you to take over okay. my kitchen. Please go ahead. Um, you do know what other role I do, don't you, as a judge? Um, I was told, <laughs> yes. <laughs> do you mind while you're, while you're cracking on? Do you mind if I have a little please, slice? Please, please, I'm, I'm dying dig to in. try what a proper Black Forest Gatto is. So what do you have to do first, Falco? Right, first we do our dough, which is basically some flour. It's very simple. Flour, a pinch of salt, a bit of oil and water. And we mix that dough. It needs to be a strong flour, otherwise we don't get enough gluten. And now we work the dough so it develops this gluten which we need for bending it. Yes. That takes about 10, 15 minutes. Nowadays we have machines. In my days it was an apprentice shop. Can you just take us through this Black Forest Gatto? Obviously I see the, the cherries in here as well. Yes. As you see inside, the structure is chocolate sponge. I use a truffle cream with uh, sour cherries. Yep. And the cream which has at least 10% kish on it. You layer it up, set it overnight, uh, and finish it the morning after. OK. It's got a beautiful, light flavour. Yeah. It, it's, that is, that's a great cake. I think this is a prime example of a cake not being sickly sweet. I mean, it's the same, like, if you have a look, the other one I brought you, the Sacha Torte. Sacha Torte, yeah. And if you want to dig into that as well, while I check, I need a bit more water. Absolutely, for... yes. Yeah. Right. Let's try this one. And I love... That's nice. That's very good. It's very delicate as well. Yeah. So how long does that dough actually mix for, then? 
It depends on the strength of the flour. It is 10, 15 minutes, sometimes 20 minutes, but we want it smooth as well. So when we come to the bending part of it, we don't have lumps in it which might drop it. So what's the next stage from that then? When this is ready, we take it out and let it rest. Is this going to be in your way? Um, we can move it a bit aside. I'll, I'll move it over there. I mean, I'll... if you want to eat more, please. I will. No, absolutely. I don't need to be asked twice, Falco. I'll tell you that much. Yeah, I'll keep that there anyway, I think. I think it's probably a good idea. So what are you doing at the moment? You're basically chopping up the apples like this, are you? Yes. OK, so once you've chopped up the apples, you end up with a huge bowl like this. What's, yes. what's the next stage? We have to melt butter. OK. Make uh, a beurnoisette. So it right. gives a sort of like nutty taste to it. Uh, okay. How long have you actually been in the UK? I'm 15 years in the UK now. So what do you think of the baking standard in this country? You can't compare an apple to a pear, really. I mean, it's completely different. I like it. It's very traditional. And the nice thing of it, it's coming back. Yeah, the artisan side of yes. things is coming back. Yeah, sure. I mean, that is the nice thing of it. I know. I mean, that's what we fight in Germany as well. Uh, it's gone a bit away and it's coming back. Yes. So, OK, I think we can start bending our dough. For that, I need all the water off the table. I'll leave my cake there just in case I need it. Can you tell me, Falco, with this cake, I mean, if you messed it up and gave that, uh, tried to sell that in Germany, what would happen? It depends what you do wrong. If it's a, a protected name like Black Forest Gato, and I make it with a vanilla sponge and, let's say, strawberries, mm. I'm actually getting jailed because what? it's a protected recipe and it has to have this. Otherwise, you can't call it like that. So you could, you could get jailed? Yes, your shop gets closed down. <laughs> it's like here, uh, if you sell bread under weight, like yeah. weights and measure will come and close That's you down. That's true. It's well, exact, that, that is very true. It's exactly the same. So what have you got in there? You've got your... So I'm basically making now my mix where the apples will rest on in the strudel. Yeah. Uh, it's breadcrumbs, it's uh, cinnamon sugar, it's a bit of almonds. Basically, when we, when we cook the apples, the juice will come out yeah. and these crumbs will... They soak it in so it so stays this is a form of bake, so it just yes. soaks into that exactly. rather than anything else. Right. So what next then? Dough. That's our rested dough. Uh-huh. You see it's quite a bit sticky, but you will see it'll be fine. Yes. So you see, we're coming quite thin. Yeah. And now it's the time for our either tablecloth. We use today here an apron just to demonstrate that works as well. Okay. So I have to put flour on this so the dough doesn't stick. Put flour all over my apron. So. You see, we start bending. Do you know what? One of the things I love is watching other masters wear. I think it's great. You can see. If you would have now a newspaper, we could read it through. Absolutely. Yeah? Well, it's nice and thin. That's a lovely dough, that, actually. I am... That's British flour, that. Probably. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Butter. Now, this is where the taste comes in. Don't be shy. Yep. Falco lines the pastry with breadcrumbs to soak up the juice from the apples while they're cooking. I remember the strudels from the 80s were all this sort of flaky puff pastry. It was a cheat strudel, really, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. And it gave the wrong impression. Yeah, absolutely. But this is a real thing, and this is why I brought it to you. So, rum raisins. Yeah. And that gets soaked overnight? Yes. Yeah. I add a bit rum as well for the apples. So, almonds. Is that toasted? Toasted? Yes, yes. Yep. Always, if you use nuts, always toasted. Now, this is the tricky part. We have to flip the dough over. And this is why we need the cloth. We just flip it once over yeah. and shape it. Yeah, it looks a bit like a sausage now. Yes, absolutely. But I'm German, you know, we like our sausages. <laughs> so, we use as well the butter as glue. Put on the end a strip, flip that over. So now is our last chance to shape it. Mm -hmm. Now, why do we put it as well on that? Is I can move it. If you try to lift this up, it completely will break apart. Yeah. Yeah. Please, we yeah. make a nice ending. Yeah. We just grab it like a sausage as well. Mm -hmm. Don't be shy on it. It's actually because of the good British flour, as you said earlier on. Which it doesn't do. Which it doesn't do now. <laughs> <laughs> now we need our baking tray. So now we grab it, move it over. Yeah? Yeah. Now the funny bit is how do we get it off? Oh, yeah, exactly. 
and just roll this over. And in the bakery, you would have a tray with a rim. Yeah, of yeah? course, yeah, yeah. The next trick is, as well at home, you make a crease and put a baking tin against it because this dough wouldn't hold, so it would run flat. So basically, uh, keep it. I remember when I first made one of these, I had that problem. It, it, it basically flattened, flattened out like yeah. this, yeah. I mean, so that's the way to strengthen it, to give it its structure as yes, tight. Yes, give it a nice shape. Got, yeah, yeah. Let me Got put it. butter on top. It looks a bit messy at the moment, but you will see when it comes out of the oven, it all disappears. Now, w would you, when this is baking off, would you normally bring it out and brush it again with more butter? I would do it half baking time. Yeah. And then when it comes out again. Yes. Okay, yeah. so you are layering up the, the butter, more butter, more butter, and this is what gives it its distinctive colour. Correct. You should taste the butter. Yes. And it's not a slim line stuff. Fantastic. Okay. Good. In the oven it goes. So, how long will that bake for now then? About 35 to 40 minutes. Now, I think you've got one down here. This looks beautiful. I can smell it actually. This is exactly how it should look like. You see, inside, the dough is only on the outside. Mm -hmm. uh, the apples are nice and moist. The only thing what we need now is dust the icing sugar on, maybe whip a bit cream, ice cream or vanilla sauce. And that's your apple strudel. Fantastic. I mean, I can see this is, is real quality. It, it looks as you'd imagine the strudel should look. I mean, I've seen one of these in Germany before, and it does look fantastic. And the ratio of apples to the pastry, it, it, it's huge. Just, all apple. Correct. It's called an apple strudel, not a dough strudel. <laughs> exactly <laughs> right. Falco certainly knows his German puddings, and I'll be making a British classic for him later, a gypsy tart. I grew up in the north of England, but my adopted home is Kent, where I've lived and baked for many years. It's a county rich in orchards, soft fruits, hops, and this little fella, the Kentish cobnut which happens to be the star in my next recipe, a cobnut pear and sticky toffee tart. The little-known cobnut is actually a cultivated hazelnut, which grows in orchards, or plats, as they're known. In Kent, they're a much-loved part of the local food heritage. Yeah, we bought this property about 21 years ago and inherited the ancient nut plat with it. And this nut plat is um, about two and a half acres and we think there's only about 200, 250 acres of cop nuts left in the UK. So in proportion, it's quite a considerable sized nut plat. The cob nut is very definitely a Kentish harvest. Kent uh, was also very well known for picking hops and the um, harvest would, or the harvest workers would pick the hops, pick the apples and then move into the cob nuts. The flavor of the cob nut it's distinctively nutty. It's a little bit sweet, and it's a very soft, gentle nut. It lends itself very well to being added with other ingredients. And in fact, it works well with most of the crops that we associate with the garden of England. Cob nuts are usually eaten fresh, rather than dried like most nuts, and are in season from mid-August to mid-October. They're rich in vitamin E and calcium and go great with other ingredients, which is good news because I want to add their nutty flavour to my cob nut, pear and sticky toffee tart. Our cob nuts are quite hard to cultivate. As you can see, the rows... As you can see, the rows are very tightly planted, so we generally can't get a tractor between them. That means we can't mow the grass to keep the vegetation down, so we have to have the sheep in to help keep everything to a low level. They're great food to eat, just sitting down communally, cracking them open after dinner and eating them. And of course, what's fantastic is that they're local. So that's how cob nuts are grown in Kent. Now, I want to find out how the locals eat them. Emma Jane Eames lives down the road. She spent four years in Italy, and on her return, she decided to use cob nuts in some of the dishes she's been making overseas. I've been working with cob nuts about eight months or so. Uh, I first came across them when I moved home from Italy and wanted to find a substitute for the traditional pine nuts to use in a pesto. Emma's revolutionized an Italian classic with cob nuts. She uses them to make a pesto. I think with pine nuts, in pesto, it's, it's not as creamy as with cob nuts. 
They're extremely buttery, so add a real depth of flavour, rather than pine nuts can get lost into the background. Emma's pesto recipe is garlic, basil, those all-important cob nuts, some local cheese and a dash of olive oil. The nice hot bread will absorb all the garlic and the basil. And there you have some simple mushroom and pesto bruschetta. From kitchen savoury to wholesale chocolates, the humble cob nut is an extremely versatile ingredient. Debbie Carter runs a business making chocolates, which she sells to a wide range of customers, from farmers markets to five-star hotels. Well, I love the flavour of nuts and chocolate together. Just think it's a fabulous combination. And because I do believe in using good quality local products where I can, cob nuts fits the bill. Debbie's range of chocolates runs from dipped cob nuts to her favourite recipe, a praline. It's a hot mixture of glucose and cream poured over chocolate drops. And the heat from that will just melt the chocolate. Then she adds the chopped cob nuts. And once they're set, they're ready. There we go. So I've seen what the people of Kent do with their cob nuts, and I'm joined in the kitchen by Rachel and Debbie. I've heard of cob nuts so long, until recently I've never had them, and I'm quite annoyed with myself now because I've never actually tried them. Well, if you've been in Kent 15 years, you should have tried them before. I've heard of them, but I never thought, oh, yeah, it's just one of those things, you know? In its raw form, it looks pretty ugly, doesn't it? Oh, no, it looks beautiful. Do you think so? Yes, you've been around I it too do. long. No, it usually <laughs> looks lovely. It's different to any nut that you've tried before. It's got the texture of a Brazil nut. It seems to have that depth of flavour and a slightly more chewiness than you, you, than you get with a hazelnut or a, or a peanut. But then it's got a lot of nutty flavour and a little hint of spice that sort of sits at the top, almost peppery. OK. So is it very seasonal then? What sort of times are you looking at? Uh, we start picking um, mid to the end of August when we pick the green nut and then pick through till early October when the nuts start to fall on the ground. You use cob nuts in chocolates? Yes. How does that differ to sort of hazelnuts, for instance? Um, well, you just said yourself that you prefer the taste of the cob nut, and mm. I think a lot of people do when they try them side by side. The flavour is better. So mm. why buy hazelnuts when I can get cob nuts locally? I love the idea that they're in chocolates, and I love the idea that it's Kentish cob nuts. Can I just have a look at one of those in there? Do you mind if I try a little bit? No, do. Go ahead. I like chocolate. Do you? Yeah, I do. Do they sell well? Yes, the, the cob nut bar is one of the most popular bars that, that I sell. Mmm, that's gorgeous. I mean, really nice. That's dangerous to me, that. Right, I'm going to make something a little bit different. What I'm going to do, I'm going to use pears, I'm going to use dates, and I'm going to use the cob nuts, and I'm going to turn it into a tart. So it's quite rich. It's got a toffee in there as well, so there's a lot of elements going on in this. First, heat some dates and milk in a pan until the dates go soft. You end up with something like this. You then get a, a masher in there and give it a good bit of bashing just to really soften down those dates and break them down a bit. So there you have it. That's your basic mix, which goes in here. So a bit like when you do sticky toffee pudding. Yeah, yeah, it is, absolutely. Now, the next thing I'm going to do is knock up a quick toffee sauce. In a separate pan, heat some soft brown sugar and butter. And then what you need to do is soften that down, and it will melt fairly quickly. We'll leave that alone for a minute. Add butter to the softened dates and mix. This is going to be the melee that's going to be the basis for the whole dish. Keep an eye on your pan of butter and brown sugar. Now, this is beginning to melt. Oh, it smells lovely. Now I'm going to add the cream to that. Once the sugar has melted, take the pan off the heat and allow the sugar to dissolve. And that's your basic toffee sauce. You can still feel a few grains down at the bottom. <laughs> Mum, have I still got any cream on my face? Yes, yeah, you, yeah, you have, actually. I have. <laughs> You're going to play Mum for me. Where is it? I won't lick it. How about that? <laughs> <laughs> OK, there we have it. It's 
smells fantastic. It's, it's so easy to do. I mean, it's melted down. Now, I can't feel... Now, I can't feel any sugar in that at all. I'm going to leave that to one side. Going back to the mix, fold in two eggs, add ground almonds and plain flour. You can see this mixture coming together. Add brown sugar and black treacle. You can see the colour instantly. It's going to be quite dark pudding, this. Look at the colour of that. It's fantastic. You can really smell the treacle, actually. It's really inviting. You can. Vanilla, a little bit of flavour. Bicarb gives it a little bit of kick in there as well, and it'll grow a little bit around what the pears are going to do inside the tart. So, again, that's the basis of the tart. Line a tart shell with short crust pastry. Because we're filling this, we don't need to blind bake it. Then slice some ripe pears and put them in the tin. This will add a gorgeous flavour, and you know you're going to get one in every bite. It doesn't really matter how it's laid out, because you're going to cover this then in sauce. Now it's time for those all-important cob nuts. And why have I not tried these before? I'm annoyed with myself, actually. Add them to the date mix, then pour the toffee sauce over the base before adding the rest of the filling. Look at that. Can't wait for you to try it and tell me what you think. Can't wait either. <laughs> <laughs> Cover with more cob nuts and it's ready for cooking. Now, this is going to go into the oven at 180 for 40 to 45 minutes and it will set and you'll see visibly it'll just draw back slightly from the pastry. So I'm going to pop that straight in. And over here, you can see the baking powder has risen up all the way along. And this is what you call a proper pudding. I think I'll just take a little slice out of it so you can see it. It's beautiful and soft. And inside, you have that gorgeous pear, heightened by the flavour of the cob nuts. So you have cob nut, pear, and sticky toffee tart. Packed with fruity flavour and chocolate nuttiness, this pudding is delicious on its own or with a drop of fresh cream. You're going to have to wait a little bit longer before you get a chance to try it. Earlier, Konditermeister Falco Burkett set the bar high with some spectacular German desserts, including his take on that 80s classic, apple strudel. When I was thinking of a, a pudding to make for Falco, based on the fact that I've just tried his, certainly the Black Forest Gatto was the best one I've ever had, and the strudel with the complicated pastry and the way that you stretch it out, I thought I'd make something that's sort of equal stature in the country. Now, this particular dish comes from Kent, uh, my adopted county at the moment, and it is, of course, the ubiquitous gypsy tart. OK, so I'm teasing Falco a little bit there. He showed me exquisite German baking, but a gypsy tart is a simple recipe and a school dinner classic. Now, what I've got is flour, into which I'm going to add my icing sugar straight in. Then I'm going to add my butter straight in and then get my hands straight in there. Have you heard of a gypsy tart? No. Never. No. no. <laughs> it's something which, made well, is great. I think I'm happy with that. Then add an egg yolk, lemon juice and water. I'll get a spoon in there straight away and mix this together. I'm not going to knead or pummel this thing together because I don't want the gluten, even in the plain flour, to sort of bind this thing together. This, uh, this tart originated from a story that was told that a gypsy woman made it to fatten up her skinny kids. Oh, and so it's that. a very sweet, it's very, very sweet tart. So I've broken down this into breadcrumb, just had a little splash of water, mixed that together, and there it is. So that whole pastry, you pop in a bit of wrap, pop it in the fridge, chill that down, it solidifies the butter, then bring it out, leave it to come back to temperature for a couple of minutes, and that'll be perfect to line your tart. Now, to line the tart, I've chosen an eight-inch ring, lined it all the way down, leave it to overlap the sides, put some baking beans in there with some silicon paper, and bake it off for about 20 minutes at around 200, quite high, and it'll darken nicely. You then to bring it out with a knife, trim it neatly all around the outside, and that's the basis for your tart. Now, 
This is the complicated bit. You get a bowl. You get some soft, light brown sugar. You get some evaporated milk, condensed milk. And then the next stage, you get your whizzer. Complicated word, that whizzer. Do you get that in Germany as well? Whizzer. Yeah, of The course. thingy. <laughs> the thingy. And then you blitz this all together. And you can see it's beginning to froth up slowly, dissolving the sugar at the same time. And then we'll quick look at it. That'll do. Now, that pours straight into your tart shell. And then you bake this off at 180 degrees for about 15 minutes. It doesn't take very long. And you pop that straight into it. You've got to keep an eye on it, because it's sugar. It's pretty much pure sugar. It will bake extremely quickly. Now, once you've baked it off, it will come out of the oven looking like that. You can see the lightness has gone from it. You've got that beautiful pastry on the outside. And then to highlight it, I like to add a few little touches. It's almost caramel-like, this cake, which is pretty much all it is. Get some strawberries around the outside. And then to finish it off, just one whole strawberry, bunged on the top. There you have it. We've seen some pretty impressive cakes from you, Falco, to be honest. There you have it. Gypsy tart with a strawberry twist. What do you reckon, then, Falco? Give me a fork. I'd like to try it. In a minute. <laughs> the good old gypsy tart. Sometimes the simple British classics are the best. This is the moment I always enjoy, sharing food with my guests. Thank you, guys, for bringing all your ingredients and for bringing this fantastic stuff to our table. Falco, thank you for these beautiful cakes. I think we better tuck in. First, the corned beef plate pie with fresh, home-cured corned beef from Chris. I've got your Whopper here. It's oh. you've got the biggest bit there. You there. Go. <laughs> there you go. Fantastic. It looks good. Has it got a soggy bottom? <laughs> no, it hasn't. I don't think so, anyway. No. No, it hasn't. I'm quite happy with that. Mm. Yeah, I like that. Mm -hmm. It's a bit like braising steak, isn't it? Mm. Yeah. It really tastes it's like really beef, whereas corned beef. beef doesn't actually taste very much yeah. of beef normally, does exactly, it? Exactly, yeah. Next, the Kentish cobnut pear and sticky toffee tart. If I put this, pop this on your plate, any soggy bottom there? Thank no. You. no. I think we got away with it. <laughs> <laughs> got away with it. <laughs> it just doesn't work. These are your cob nuts, Bob, aren't they? Yeah. Thank you. See if it does the cob nut justice. I, I love the way the date complements the sponge date. filling. Mm. It's fantastic. Mm. Really delicious. My final dessert is that British classic gypsy tart, which I've topped with fresh strawberries. Falco, would you like to take that gypsy tart over to yourself? <laughs> um, don't need to cut it up, that's just for you. Um, what we're going to do is... Um, <laughs> I want you to try it. <laughs> We've all tried it before. Have a big way. Just okay, tell us what you think. Do you want some strudel? Oh, I love some. Okay. Okay. And finally, Falco's strudel, full of flavour and packed with apples. Oh, the pastry, look at that, the way it flakes. That's great. What's still going on? Nobody wants to try this one here. Sweet enough? I thought it's sweeter, actually. Really? Yeah. How is the strudel? Delicious. Nice. The way the apples have still got a little bit of bite to them as well, mm. and it's tart. That's delicious. That's what it's all about, really. Great food, great company, full stomach and a bit of wine. See you again next time on Pies and Puds. What do you think of this thing?